it looks slow. Hallelujah. He cares about his people. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We will not have a uh, first step tonight. Amen. So uh, y'all see Sister Battle. She'll give y'all credit. I think everybody needs to sit in on this teaching anyway. Let's go ahead and repeat these words after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I'm a believer and not a doubter. I'm a doer and not just a hero. And my life is the better. Having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Go with me, first of all, to Psalms 91. Psalms 91. We're going to do something a little different tonight. God dropped this word in my spirit right before I came to do the teaching on Sunday morning has been birthing in my spirit. And then Sister Adrian confirmed it when she prayed tonight that we're in the house. Psalms 91, we're going to begin reading that verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide uh, under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. There shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the error that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thy eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague, plague come near thy dwelling. And then let's go over, transition over to Colossians chapter 4 in the New Testament. There is a word from the Lord this evening. Psalms 91, that's one of my favorites. Whenever I feel that my back is up against the wall, I pull out Psalms 91. It has seen me through many highs and many lows. Colossians chapter 4. It's the last of the prison epistles by Paul. We're going to begin reading at verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be without grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Amen? You can take your seats. Tonight, I'm on assignment to teach on a subject I think is touching every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. Tonight, my subject is fear. Amen? Fear. Father, we come before you right in the name of Jesus. Lord, we honor you for your word. We know that your word is already blessed. Father, of and within myself, I'm incapable and I'm inadequate. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would anoint this vessel of clay, that you would anoint these lips of clay, that I would only speak that which you have ordained to be spoken during this season and in this time. And I pray, Lord, that you would make my tongue as the pen of a ready writer. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Fear. Um. There's nothing like fear to traumatize an individual or to traumatize people or a nation or the world. Fear. I don't have to call to your attention the rhetoric that's being postulated across the airways concerning the crisis that the world is literally facing. And we are literally facing it as a world. Whether it be an epidemic or a pandemic, Satan seeks to separate our, seek, seek to saturate 
our consciousness with fear and foreboding. If one isn't mindful, one can easily be manipulated to participate in this psychological exercise and forget that we have a heavenly father who is intimately engaged in the lives of his people. It is during instances of this nature that we must consult our spiritual playbook to establish guidance and to conduct ourselves accordingly. Amen. Go with me to Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3, which is right before the book of Psalms. Job chapter 3. Fear resonates in our mind. It, 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 it comes to our mind. It can come at um, a suggestion or an act. And once it's planted in our mind, if you're not careful, you will hold on to it until it begins to fester and grow. In Job chapter 3, verse 25, verse 25 he said, For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. Amen? Amen. If we're not careful, we'll get caught up and we'll begin to act and speak just like the world. Amen? Amen? Now, understand something. I believe in wisdom and I believe that we should uh, position ourselves and, and do the things that we need to do. Uh, but I was reading an article the other day, and this happened in a super Walmart in Australia. Three ladies got to fighting over toilet paper. One lady had a cart full of toilet paper, and the other lady said, could I just have one? And the lady said, no, you cannot have one. And the police, they got it. It was so bad that the police got involved in it. This is all, amen, because of fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of that which we don't know that's going to happen. And I thank God that we have the Bible, and the Bible tells us to fear not. Anytime an angel encountered an individual, the first thing that angel knew was to tell them to fear not because they know looking at an angel is an awesome sight. And he always told them, whether it be Gabriel or Michael, he said, fear not. And I'm here tonight to tell you that every God's of what we see, every God's of what we hear, we are not to fear. Because we serve a righteous God. We serve a holy God. And as I search the scriptures, go ahead, don't pay the pay, give him some praise. Amen. Because see, you got to look the face, you got to look the devil in the face. I will not fear. As long as I got breath in my body, I'm gonna fight. And we're not to fear, and we're gonna to continue to fight, and we're gonna continue to proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Amen. The thing that you got to understand is, amen, in many cases. That which we are fearful of is worse than an actual event because we put so much energy and so much uh, 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 thought process into that which has come that then that when it does come, it ain't as bad as we thought it was going to be. And we look at ourselves and say, oh, man, I can't believe I took myself through that mental exercise and almost had a heart attack. My high blood pressure went up. My, high, my hypertension got all acted up all because I feared. Listen to this powerful assertion. God never gave us the wherewithal to fear. God never created us to fear. He never created an environment where we were supposed to be going to and we'll be fearful. We're to depend on him. I don't care what your finances look. We're not to fear. I don't care, amen, what's going through your body. We're not to fear. Our hope is in God. With God, all things. He didn't say most things. He didn't say many things. The Bible said that with God, all things are possible. Fear originated in the Garden of Eden. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Fear. And I'm teaching on this because in regards of what happens, we got to understand that we have a blessed hope. See, the world don't understand uh, that they are a spirit. They live in a body and they have a soul. They don't understand that when life ceases on this end, amen, that 
After this, the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. We have a blessed hope because we know we belong to God. We know that God has our best interest. We know that, amen, everything we need, all we got to do is go to the Father. I right, listen to what I'm saying. And we're not to fear. We're not to fold up. And you, we're going to learn tonight the dangers of fear. We're going to learn tonight that when you allow fear, that when you embrace fear, it will traumatize you. It will cripple you to inaction. In Genesis chapter 3, let's go to verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and, and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Adam, who was accustomed to God visiting him each and every day. But on this particular day, something changed. And what changed was from a spiritual position, Adam had got demoted. He had got demoted because he did something that God told him not to do. And what he did was he opened up the door, not just to sin, but the knowledge of good and evil. See, that's what we're trying to tell our children. Don't grow up before your time. Don't rush your life. Take your time. Enjoy what stage of your life that you're in. Amen. Don't rush out here because you're going to find that once you get it, it's not quite what you think it is. I remember, amen, when I wanted to stay up late as a child. Then when I got an opportunity to stay up late, I found out it wasn't what I thought it would be. Amen. I remember as a young kid, amen, so you can't do it now, but we were in the clubs at 14 and 15. And I remember I couldn't wait to get to the club. But when I got to the club, I discovered it was not what I thought it was going to be. Amen. I, be I remember when we started uh, messing around with the, the little girls and things of that nature. And then when we did certain things, we discovered it was not what we thought it was going to be. Amen. And what Adam did, he opened up a door into the knowledge of good and evil. And once he did it, he discovered this ain't what I thought it was going to be. And so now I can't commune with God because of fear. Hallelujah. I can't enjoy the presence of God. I'm trying to hide myself. And then I had to cover my nakedness, amen, as if God did not have a clue to where I was or what state I'm in. Don't you know that God was not surprised by the coronavirus? It did not catch him off God. God knew it before the foundations of the world. And you got to understand that when we read our words, he said in the 24th chapter of Matthew, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. You better hear what I'm trying to say. We got the playbook. We shouldn't be shocked. We shouldn't be caught off God. Because this world as we know it is racing toward the end of time. And God is still in control. He will not let Satan have his way with you. He will not allow Satan to do anything. He will not allow Satan to step outside his bounds. Just ask Job. He let, go, he let God let Job, let Satan do everything he wanted to do to Job. He said, you can touch his body, but you can't touch his life. And guess what? Satan couldn't go outside the bounds of the authority of God. You better recognize who you are and whose you are. You better hear what I'm trying to tell you. We belong to the most high God. Oh, my God. You better hear what's in my spirit. We don't serve an inferior God. We don't serve a God that's buried somewhere in a tomb. Our God sits in the heavens, and Jesus Christ sits right beside him, and he's ever living to make intercession on behalf of his people. I'm trying to tell you, you got to hold on to your faith. I'm trying to tell you, stop letting your heart grow fearful. I'm trying to tell you, stand up like you got a backbone. And I don't care what you're facing. You tell the devil, I belong to God. And you can't touch my finances. You can't touch my body. You can't touch my job. You can't touch my family. You better let him know who you stand for. And you better speak that thing out of your mouth. Give God some praise in here. Come on now, praise him. 
Praise him. Praise him like you mean it. Glory to Jesus. We walking around here worse than the world. We trying to tuck a tail and go in a corner and hide. And God ain't made us to do that. Amen. You better hear what I'm trying to tell you. Amen. That every time. Let me tell you something. In 19, I want to get my figures right, but I was reading. Uh, when this thing came out, I started doing some research. And I, and, and I ran up on this thing in, in 1908. Uh, when some soldiers brought back this flu um, from overseas. They was in the war, in the first war. And um, it's, it, it, uh, uh, they, they call it the Spanish flu. But it didn't originate in Spain. Actually, it originated in Europe. But the first cases was found in Spain. And so they blamed it on the, the, the country of Spain. But it did not come from Spain. And yes, it did wreak havoc. Yes, because people did not pay attention. Yes, because people did not obey. Amen. And what we got to do is that's why we get into situations like this where we have to obey not only the, uh, what the word says, but we got to obey what those who are in government and in high places who are in authority stands us to do. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Okay. Go with me to... Second Timothy chapter one. Second Timothy chapter one. So now we know where fear originated. It originated in God. Prior to the fall of Adam, there was no such thing as fear. No such thing as fear. Do you know that when Jesus Christ walked the face of the earth, that he never feared? Anything or anybody? There was a situation in the book of Matthew where Jesus told them, let us cross over to the other side. And so the disciples were still up. And Jesus was tired because he had been ministering all day. And he went in the, 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 the bottom of the boat, took a blanket, rolled it up and made a pillow. And went to sleep. But a storm came up. This was not an ordinary storm. This was a storm that was raised up by demons. To try to take the son of God out. And the disciples, they was fighting against the waves and fighting against the storm. It got so bad that they told Jesus, they went up there and woke Jesus up. They said, Master, don't you care that we almost perish? Jesus got to be the coolest person I know. Jesus got up. He didn't even acknowledge them. He just told the wind to chill out, and he told the storm, peace, be still. Then he rebuked them. He said, why were you fearful, and why you have such little faith? And so my question to you is, why are you so fearful? And why are you of such little faith? When we are connected to Jesus. Don't you know that you've been in situations before that you didn't think you was going to make it? You were in relationships that truth be told, you almost lost your mind. And sometimes you look back and you try to wonder how you got out of it. And the only thing you can say is, but God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of y'all, some of us, have been in financial situations. We thought we was about to lose everything we had. And at the set up point in time, we got delivered. The bill was paid on time. Amen. Unexpected checks came in the mail. And we look back. And often within ourselves, we can't comprehend it. But the only thing we can say is, but God. And I'm here to tell you. That we're going to look back on this time, this day and age, because we are believers. And we don't function like everybody else do. We are bi-dimensional. We operate in a natural realm. But we also operate in the spirit realm. And if Jesus told us, Storm, that peace be still. And he tells me in Matthew 28 that all power from heaven and earth has been given to me. Go. He's telling me that I can operate the same way that he did. 
and we're going to begin to speak and pray against this virus. And we're going to ask God, God, uh, make it dissipate. God, render it powerless and ineffective in the name of Jesus. See, it's time for us, instead of us to be whining and crying, it's time to pray. It's time to bombard heaven. See, there's a situation going on in heaven that if I believe God strong enough, I can take that same situation and bring it to the earth wind. The Bible says, whatever is going on in heaven, I decree and declare it shall be in the earth. The last time I checked, ain't no sickness in heaven. There's no lack. There's no poverty. And there sure ain't no disease. And so God, as it is in heaven, so shall it be in the earth. Because the Bible said, whatsoever a man decreed, that shall it be so. The Bible said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. As a man thinketh, so is he. I'm a child of God. I can call those things which be not as though they are. Are you in 2 Timothy chapter 1? Verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hmm. We quote this a lot. You've got to understand that fear brings torment. And if we get around the wrong group of people and listen to the wrong type of conversations, that which they are talking about will get in our ear gate. And that's why the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Some of us, we let this stuff get on the inside of our ears and we begin to meditate. When we had an opportunity to cast it down, we didn't. Now, instead of wrestling with a thought, we're wrestling and entangled with a stronghold. And so he said, bringing every thought, every imagination. What is imagination? When you begin to think about things you ain't got no business thinking about. When your mind begins to drift. And see, our minds will play tricks on us. It'll begin to drift. We'll come in church. And because somebody didn't get an opportunity to speak to us, they could be going through something or had something on their mind. The devil will come sit on your shoulder. See, I told you, they didn't like you. That's what, it, that's what an imagination is. And that's why you got to take that thing and cast it down. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, my shy, yeah, You got to hear what I'm trying to tell you. Oh, my God. Stop letting people plant seeds in your mind and see what the problem is. It goes down to your mind. And if you don't fight hard enough, it'll get in your spirit. And once to get into your spirit, now it's hard to root up. That's why Paul told Timothy, God has not given us. He didn't say fear, but a spirit. Because he recognized once you embrace it, you're going to have to wrestle to get rid of this thing. That's why I don't have anybody that's talking around me any kind of foolishness. I can't let that stuff get in my ear gate. I can't let that stuff get down in my spirit. Because I know he given me a mind of love and power and a sound mind. What you mean by love? That means I'm going to love my brethren. Because I'm going to show you a scripture in a moment. That when you, that perfect love cast out fear and if you're not connected to God in the right way if you're walking around in unforgiveness you just open up a door where Satan can come and plant seeds in your mind and now instead of wrestling with a thought I got a stronghold some of you all you can't walk around in perfect love because you got a stronghold of unforgiveness a stronghold of bitterness a stronghold of some things on the inside of you 
You got to get that stuff out of you. And then when you can walk in perfect love, for you know it, the fear is going to go away. Things not going to bother you. Things not going to worry you. When the devil try to bring things your way, you're going to dismiss them because you recognize that you're in a place positionally, spiritually, and the devil is under your feet. He's under your feet. I hope does not lay in the wisdom of this world because we're not governed by the world system. When we allow ourselves to get caught up in those things that are diametrically opposed to the kingdom of God, then we demonstrate our willingness to abide by what we're experiencing, experiencing in the natural realm. That's why we don't want to be carnal Christians. A carnal Christian is moved by every wind, every doctrine, every wind, ups and downs, up there, no stability in their, in their lives at all. That's why James said our double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's time for the body of Christ to get some stability in their lives. Some of us having too many conversations with the devil. Because you do know he will have a conversation that will appease you. Oh, this is good. Satan will bring you, or let's put it this way, Satan will attack you at the point of your vulnerability. He ain't coming at you at your strength. He coming at where you vulnerable. If you got low self-esteem, that's where he's going to attack you at. At your point of vulnerability. He's going to attack. If you've got something going on in your mind that you haven't reconciled with and allow God to remove that thing, he's going to attack you in your mind. If you struggle in your flesh with anything, he's going to attack you at your point of vulnerability. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Let's go deeper. I'm going to read from the Amplified Version. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear. But he's given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline. Abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. One of the words or one of the root words of discipline is disciple. So when we become a disciple of Jesus Christ, we are literally disciplining ourselves to act just like Christ would. In every area of our lives, Christ never feared. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did not function in fear. The only thing that Christ got, got Christ upset was, watch this, he knew there was going to come a time that he was going to be separated from the Father. When our sins hung on him. And watch this. Christ had never experienced separation from God. He didn't even know how it feel. But that's why when he was in the garden, the Bible says that he sweat with great droplets of blood. The agony of what he had to go through, it wasn't our sins that he was worried about. He had never been separated from God. And he was trying to reconcile in his spirit what, what was it like. But he knew that his ways was to please God and not do what he wanted to do. Now, what is it that God wants you to do that you want to do that you know is God, but it ain't going to be comfortable for you? That's why he said, pick up your cross daily. Not on Sunday, not just on Wednesday. He said daily. Every day, pick it up. Every day, you should be walking to the enemy's camp. And you should be the light in the midst of darkness. Don't get into conversation because they talked about the coronavirus. Amen. Don't buy into what they're buying in because they don't have what you have. They're not connected to who you're connected to. God said, I know the thoughts I have towards you. Did I just read? He said, a thousand will come by your, by your side, 10,000 by your right hand, but it will not come nowhere near you. And one translation said, it won't even come near your dwelling. I'm a believer. He said, one ain't come near my dwelling. 
I've already assigned angels around my house. I did this years ago. Even since we've been here, angels are on this premises. Angels are controlling this region. Why? Because an apostolic ministry has hit this place. Yes, they got other apostolic ministries, and I can't tell you what they're doing, but I can sure tell you what our assignment is. Our assignment is to make a difference in this region. Our assignment is to bring people into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Our assignment is to bring the backslide back to the house of God. Our assignment is to strengthen those who are in the body of Christ. That's our assignment. Our assignment is to render demons powerless and ineffective. Demons of prostitution. Demons of drugs. Demons of alcoholism. That's our assignment. And we got the bun bar. So I'm not going to let a little virus that's only here for a short period of time because it's subject to change. I'm not going to let a virus stand in the way of what God has called us to do. Not this time, devil. Fear is a strong emotion caused by great worry about something dangerous, painful, or unknown that is happening or might happen. That's from Webster. That's what fear is. One time I was a little kid, and I don't know why. I guess even then God was connecting with me spiritually. I'm talking about a real little kid. In first grade, I, I had a consciousness of death, and I feared death. And I would literally lay in bed some mornings before I went to school, and, and, and I would get pictures of myself being buried alive. Didn't understand the whole concept of spirit, soul, and body. Now that I'm saved, I recognize that since I'm connected to God, since my life cease on this side, that my spirit and soul is going re- to be reunited with him instantly. So now I no longer fear death. Amen. When my grandmother passed, I didn't sit up there whining and crying and all this. She said she was ready to go. Yeah, this selfish side of me wanted her to stay because I needed her. But God was calling her home. And then I was tagged to carry on her assignment at another level. So we got to understand who is it that we belong to? Who will you believe? Whose report will you believe? Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. The objective of this teaching fear is to alleviate the emotional trauma, stress, and strain that has arisen from being bombarded with statistical analysis and various medical hypotheses surrounding the inevitable message of gloom and doom. Uh, That's Pastor Mace. That's my original stuff. I ain't got to quote that one. Please understand that I'm no way trying to trivialize our present emerging circumstances. I believe it is invaluable to be informed, but also to keep everything in its proper perspective. Are you listening to what I'm saying? In its proper perspective. There's no way God's going to deliver me from a life of sin and allow a virus to come in and take my life out. Not at this stage of my life. That's too much work. There's no way that he's going to allow me to go through the Gulf War when we didn't have the knowledge that we have right now to bring me to this point right here and snuff out my life, allow a virus to snuff out my life. There's no way at 20 years of age I can be driving on uh, sleep-covered road, flip my mother's car over, walk out, and don't even have to go to the hospital. There is no way. There's no way that he's allowed me to go on different continents to get the training, amen, to get the intestinal fortitude that having done all, I'm to stand, that I'm to be a soldier. There's no way I spent three years in Alaska, no way I went to Hungary, two tours in Germany, one tour in Korea, all over the United States, to come in this here place and time and to be taken out by a little old virus. The only thing Jesus got to do is snap his finger and it will be gone. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. 
Not this time, devil. I won't receive what you are, are transmitting over the airways. I won't receive the report of what the media is trying to get us to buy into. I won't receive it in Jesus' name. There's a work that we're doing. And we're in a good work. And we will fulfill the number of our days on the face of the earth. Yes, we will. We will do it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Take, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal will we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Go over to Isaiah chapter 46. In essence, we do not possess the entire spectrum of the unknown. But I praise God Almighty that I'm connected to him. He knows all things. As we traverse through uh, through this latest medical anomaly, let's stay focused but also remain realistic about everything that is occurring. In other words, it's important to be informed. God is not shocked by the latest occurrence. And the Holy Bible illustrates his omniscience. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, he said, Now remember the former things are old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Time exists in the palm of God. He knows what's going to happen, the end from the beginning. He already knows. He already knows the next move that you make. He already knows and makes the next decision that you're going to make. That's why it's so important, especially major decisions, that we consult God. Every decision, major decision, that I consulted with God has been fruitful. But when I don't consult God, it has not been fruitful. Sometimes it ain't just hearing his voice. It is annoying in my spirit that this is of God. When we started this church, there was a knowing, even though we were being attacked. The devil wanted to get us frustrated and get us to the point where we just throw in the towel. But we had a knowing. We was only six of us. There was a knowing. When it was Wednesday nights, it was just prophetess and myself. There was a knowing. Amen. When we went to the Holiday Inn, there was a knowing. When we went to the last building that we had, there was a knowing. When we set forth last year to get this building, there was a knowing. We didn't know how we was going to do it, but there was a knowing in our spirit that God wanted us to go down his path and every time there's anointing and we obey him we may not have the full picture but we trust him in this hour, you got to trust God. You got to trust God for your marriage. You got to trust God, amen, for your children. You got to trust God, amen, for your finances. You got to trust God, amen, on your job. You got to trust him because God has everything in the control. Okay. Real quick. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Anybody getting anything? Just want to encourage you. Hebrews chapter 13. Our faith must remain rooted and grounded in God, even during trying times. By virtue of our faith in him, God seeks to honor his word in every aspect of our lives, in every area of our lives, because, we, because our faith is rooted and grounded in him. I don't care what you're going through. He's going to bring you out. Everything. I said everything, everything, everything. Only thing you got to do is practice the principle. Amen. When I said practice the principle, you got to make sure that every doorway that would allow Satan to have legal access to your life is shut tight. Everything. Everything. 
Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man should do unto me. Do you see that? Don't look and see what other people have. You do what God told you to do. God ain't call everybody to pastor. But whatever God has called you to do, you get the same benefits as if you were pastoring. I don't get a bigger crown than you when we get before God as long as you were faithful to that which God had called you to do. But now when you step outside of your lane and do something that God didn't call you to do, you're about to forfeit your crown. That's why in my last church, I won't try to be an apostle. Amen. I seen what he went through. I seen how people gave him fits. I was just trying to support the man of God any way I could. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't a burden to him. And then when me and my wife got married, married, we made sure we weren't a burden to the man of God. If he wanted us to give, to give. If he wanted us to travel with him to support him, that's what we did. If he wanted us to clean up the church, that's what we did. Because we did everything to help the man of God to hold up his arm and not become a burden to him. And guess what? If I hadn't done that, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Because when you make a decision, it should be fruit behind it. And I'm talking about, it shouldn't be years and years down the road. You should see some fruit right away. I would like to just take that deeper, but I don't have time. Go with me to Numbers. Numbers chapter 16 quickly. Because I want to I expound on this situation here. I got to have people around me who are faith fighters, water walkers, people that can call fire down from heaven. I need some giant killers. I can't have people around me that looking at their situation and their situation overcomes them. And before you know it, they're somewhere folded up to me. I can't do it. God had to send David all the way to, to the Israelites because they had nobody up there that could champion his call and defeat Goliath. Goliath would come out there and the whole army, including the king, would run. So he said, okay, I got a trick for you. You won't live up to it. I'm going to send my servant David to take care of this giant. And it was a kid that came and killed a nine-foot giant. Why, everybody else was somewhere sniveling. Walking around. Why? Fear. David didn't go in his own strength. He said, you uncircumcised feeling stern. You about to come up against my God. You about, I'm going to deal with you. And then he didn't call Jesus' name because, you know, Jesus hadn't, hadn't come on the scene. But what he had, he used. He said, God would deliver you into my hands. He didn't even have a sword, but what he had, he used. Some of y'all are looking for a sword instead of taking out what God has already given you to use. The sword can't help you, but use what God has put at your disposal to bring the giant down. Corona is a giant, but I'm like Zerubbabel. I'm looking at a mountain, and it shall be made a plain in Jesus' name. It shall be made a plain. All right, quickly. Are you in Numbers chapter 13? All right, verse 17, real quick. Time is running out. Verse 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up to this way southward and go up into the mountain. And see the land. What is it? And the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is there that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. And what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean. Whether there be wood therein or not. Now watch this. And be ye of good courage 
and bring of the fruit of the land. Then the time was the time of the first striped grapes. You see that? So Moses, who is the leader, the de facto leader, has selected 12 individuals who are leaders of their tribes. He is giving them what we call their marching orders. They are to go into the land of Canaan, and they're going to be there for 40 days. They are to spy out the land and bring back a report of the land. Now, you can go back and read this on your own time. You need to start in Numbers chapter 12 where God tells Moses and give him his instruction. And God tells him, I've already given it to you. I've already given it to you. Now, Moses being a shepherd, he can't go. So he's got to delegate some authority. It is important to know that these 12 individuals are leaders within their respective tribes. Leaders are going to be held to a different standard than the lay people. Leaders are held to a different standard than the lay people. Leaders are going to be held to greater accountability I want you to grasp this because if you bring back something that God didn't tell you to bring back and you cause the people to fall away the blood's going to be on your hands you don't believe me okay drop down to verse 26 And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought by the word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land where thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey for this is the fruit of it. Never, now watch this. You got to understand, this is incredible. They came back with a cluster of grapes that was so big that two people had to carry them. Do you understand me? Can you imagine two big jokers coming back and they got a big old thing of grapes on between them? They were so big. And then they always said, the land is flowing with milk and honey. So what God sent us, it is true. And here's the fruit of it. Okay, let's go deeper. Now, in verse 28, there's a word they use, nevertheless. That's like saying, but. Be careful when God tells you to do something, you comes out with a but. You're about to get in trouble. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and and very great. And moreover, we saw the the children of Enoch there, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jubasites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. They're getting the people stirred up the wrong way. And Caleb still the people before Moses said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eat up the the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw giants, the sons of Enoch, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight they just downloaded a bunch of poison until approximately 1.5 million people it was probably more than that 10 individuals against two because only two people came back with a good report Caleb and Joshua Everybody else stirred up the people, okay? 
What was the results? I'm glad you asked. Go over to Numbers chapter 14. That's why in this house we got to be on one accord. I'm sorry. We will be on one accord. We will be on one accord. I promise you. If one thing I have a nose for is a spirit of rebellion, I can smell it. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 1, and all the congregation lifted their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. Do you know what that is? That is a spirit of rebellion. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Listen. God was so angry with them. Y'all can go back and read the rest for yourself. He condemned them right there. He said, you will have whatsoever you say it. Every individual, 20 years and above, died in the wilderness. God told them, every, for every day that y'all was in the land of Canaan, y'all going to wander the land for 40 years. And he said, at the end of that 40 years, not one individual we enter the promised land except Caleb and Joshua out of over 1.5 million people. The Bible said, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to eternity. You better be careful who you connect yourself to. Then God sent a plague against the ten spies and killed them because they brought back an evil report. They incited a riot among the people. This wasn't just no little small crowd. This was over a million people shouting at Moses and shouting at Aaron. And they was ready to stone them except God had intervened. And because of that evil report, the people began to become fearful. And they came up against God's anointing and against God's leaders. That's why in this house we will speak the same thing. I carry a spiritual knife with me everywhere I go. Even when I'm in a suit. To deal with stuff swiftly. You know, Tarzan, he dealt with stuff swiftly. That's why he had his knife with him at all times. I don't care if he was, you know, uh, fighting against an alligator in the water. Or a lion. Or a tiger. He dealt with it swiftly. And there are some things in your life you've been playing around with and wrestling with when you should just cut it. And walk away. That's what this thing called fear would do to you. It will get a hold of your mind. It will get in the inside of you. It will begin to metastasize. It'll go from your mind to your whole body. I remember one time, Minister Rawls got up in here, and he was preaching at our last building, one of his earlier sermons, and he said he watched this movie one time, and he was terrified of flying after that from a movie. He said it took him a long time to get over it. There's certain things we shouldn't put our eye gate on. We don't know. That's why we need to be careful with these horror movies and things of that nature. You don't know what's going to get into your spirit.
the most devastating uh, uh, nightmare on Elm Street was the first one. He only killed four people. But I was scared to go to sleep. Just listen to him. Terrified behind a movie. When Jaws came out, the, the revenue at the beaches had dried up because it was so real. People wouldn't even go inside the water behind a movie. There's some things we shouldn't be sitting around meditating on. There are certain conversations we shouldn't be having. We shouldn't have a Eve spirit. You sitting around right here befriending someone who got a demon on the inside of you, and you don't even know they're leading you to hell and away from the kingdom of God. Some of y'all involved with people, and you're trying to figure out how come we not get nowhere it's because they jealous of you. They recognize the anointing that's on your life. And they figure, if I could just get you off course slowly, before you know it, you don't know you're out of place and then you done forfeited your destiny. I have a Joshua anointing. Joshua encountered this man one night. He said, Joshua had his sword. He said, are you friend or foe? The angel said, okay, calm down, little man. Take your shoes off because you're on holy ground. But at least Joshua was ready to take him out. Are you friend or foe? Time for us to stop playing around with these demons. Demons of fear. Demons of timidity. For you know this stuff gets in your spirit. And then you are paralyzed. With fear that you can now some fear is good. Some fear would keep you on point. You scared. You know how you have been in a situation, your partner actually, you scared? No, but inside you're like, yeah. <laughs> but you know you gotta go ahead and do what you gotta do. But you can't let them know I'm scared. And so the fear keeps you on point. And then when it's over, whew, you go somewhere, Lord, I sure was scared. <laughs> Jesus. But you don't want to get to the point. And that's why Paul had to get on Timothy. Because, see, Timothy was young. And, and, see, he was around a bunch of people who were older than he was. He said, don't let them despise your youth. In one place, he said, now stir up the gift on the inside of you that was laid on with the hands of the presbytery. That's why we don't just lay hands on just anybody. I can't have anybody walking around with my anointing and you not even true to me. Mm -mm. Do you know what it took me to get this? Do you know what I had to go through? The only reason Elijah got a, a double portion of Elijah's spirit is because he served him for 15 years. He was with him everywhere Elijah went. No matter what Elijah did, when he was up, he was with him. When he was down, he was with him. He's seen Elijah's nakedness, but he did purpose in his heart. I'm going to serve the man of God. I'm going to stay true to him. And in the end, when Elijah asked him, he said, before the Lord takes me, what will you ask to me? Elijah looked at him and said, I don't want what you got. I want a double portion of it. I want a double portion of your anointing. Because watch this. Now, Elijah was in the word. And I'm getting ready to close. Because the firstborn son or daughter is supposed to get a double portion of whatever the father had. But Elijah didn't have any children, but he had a spiritual son. So Elijah, Elijah wasn't acting outside the boundaries of what was old to him. And Elijah told him, he said, now you asked a hard thing. He said, but if you see me when I'm taken up. See, that's the part we get a hold of. But see, he had three different areas to walk. He told him, stay here. He said, I won't do it. 
He said, stay here. I won't do it. Went to the third place. Stay here. I won't do it. In other words, I'm with you to the end. I need somebody that's going to be with us to the end. I need somebody that's going to be with us all the way. I don't need somebody that when the going gets tough and you begin to fall away, and when the chairs of fire came and got him, he said, my father, my father, I see you. And if you ever read the Bible, Elijah did double the miracles that Elijah did. And I'm out of time.